Now, Jeeve Galair is Mr. Carmel, August Ibrium, Mihail, August Mokolaki, Jonathan, and Lauren Kanish Vikshan, a Kondi and Kwan. Currently, Anna has Orin, Falsha Ulwar, a Korov and Shahanok, a Kalura on Ela Baltana, or the May Festival as it was known originally. The May Festival has evolved and grown over the years since 1995. We group it in a Scottish, a Gawal than a Halina, a Chak Conkin of Fodna Heron, Fushi to Takiok on a Laurel and a Publi, Augustona Kishti Garm Educus, Thon Ela Egfos Egoni, the Takiok on a Co Fortia, Augustona Milta Agria of Fodna Heron. Akanish, but while I'm false all war, a Corriv or a Kanchor and Nacht, Patrick Casti. Patrick is a lecturer in Cultural and Heritage Studies at Cavan Institute and has lectured extensively on the flax and linen history of County Cavan. He contributed to several papers to various historical groups, including Breffney Historical Society, on topics from the Quakers, the Coots of Coot Hill, the Moravian community, and that's just to mention a few. Tonight, he will provide an informative online talk entitled County Cavan's Linen Story. See Sheeranish, Agus Bon Salt Asan Okaj. Patrick. Good evening, August. Carmel. So, hello, everybody, and you're all very welcome. I see a few familiar faces there Christopher over in England, and Joan in Dublin, and Breach in Dublin, my sister. So, everybody else, you're all very welcome to this presentation. I'm going to share my screen with you now. So basically, tonight's topic is, as you can see, County Cavan's linen story. And I wanted to really highlight the importance of the linen trade to County Cavan. It was basically a very important trade in Ulster, in the whole country at one stage, but particularly in the province of Ulster. And Coutil had a very important role to play in the whole linen story in County Cavan. It was the most important town for the, for the linen markets at the time, the brown linen market. So this presentation would be divided into a number of different parts. So as you can see here, I have divided it into sections one, two, and three. So in the first section, we look at how linen was actually made because a lot of people I suppose don't know now. It's a number, it's hundreds of years ago since the trade was really at its peak here. And we're all used to going into the likes of Dunn stores and Max and Spencer's to buy ready-made clothes off the peg. You can see I'm actually wearing a white shirt. It is linen and it is Irish linen. But when I went to look at the label on the back, it says made in Hong Kong. So that's the local, the local economy for you. So we look at how it was made, you know, in the 18th century when it was a cottage industry in this area. And then in section two, we look at the growth and the collapse of the linen industry in Cavan. So the role of the landlords in particular the role of government, and then I suppose the, the what happened in the world to make it uh, such an important industry for over a century, and then it basically disappeared in this part of the country because it became mechanised in the Lagan Valley in, in Ulster. And then basically there was a bit of a resurgence. So when the linen trade went down, the production of flax kept on going, and right into the late 19th century, into the 20th century, people were still growing flax in this area. So we'll be looking at that in part three. So I'm going to start then on the first part of the presentation, how linen was manufactured. Now, um, we're very lucky to have a set of prints which were actually produced by a man called William Hinks back in the late 18th century. And he was a Waterford artist who came to Ulster and he was commissioned to produce a number of prints showing how linen was produced from start to finish. So I'm going to use some of his prints to help me describe the process to you. So we start off with flax, obviously flax seeds, and flax seeds are small little shiny seeds, as you can see here from the, um, from the illustration. And from these small seeds grow the, the flax plant. And from the flax plant, then you have the fibers, which are created into yarn and then the yarn is spun into flax cloth, linen cloth. So from very small beginning, do you have this major, this, it was a major product, a major export for Ireland, and it became world, world renowned Irishman. So you can see from the next year that there are five 
five stages to the production of yarn from start here on the left hand side you can see a flax um, plant basically so you can see the fibers here from the plant itself the stalk so that had to be rotted down in a flax hole and then when it was taken out it was dried and it was beaten to remove the outer bark once that was done then it was had to be put into uh, the third stage which was called scotching so basically in the 18th century women would have done this job they used a scotching knife which was a large wooden knife to beat the flax fibers again to try and remove any pieces of bark that were still there and then the next stage then was called um hackling so the fibers were again passed through different types of different grades of of um, nails basically rows of nails to to again to remove any loose fibers or any short fibers and the long strands were were, were kept then to produce this fine sort of almost like a horsehair type uh, material and then that was passed on to the spinners who spun it into yarn and that's the fifth stage so it was quite a long process from start to finish in the 18th century you know as, as the cottage industry so if we look at the next slide now you can see the first stages in the whole process from William Hinks one of his prints so in this one I have plowing sowing flaxseed and harrowing so and beginning the ground had to be prepared. But we're very lucky in County Cow in that we have very good type of soil for flax growing. It's sort of quite, um, it's quite heavy soil and we have a lot of rain and moisture. So it's ideal conditions for growing flax. The ground had to be prepared, had to be prepared meticulously. So basically that time, at that time, there are different descriptions of how it was done. One of them is from Charles Coote, or Charles Coote, who wrote a statistical survey of County Monaghan in 1801, published in 1801. And in one of the chapters of that book, there's a detailed description of the whole processes of producing linen and produce, you know, from flax to finish. So basically what happened was the ground had to be ploughed at least three times so that the soil had to be very fine to take the flax seed. And also then a lot, all the stones and any other sort of rubble had to be taken out of the soil. So once that was done, then you can see this particular man in the background sowing the flaxseed by hand. So he walked up and down and he, he spread the flaxseed on the ground. And once that was done, there's another image at the back of somebody harrowing the ground. So the flaxseed was loosely um, put into the ground. And after that, then it started to grow. Now, the flax was planted around this time of the year, actually April, May, and it normally then came to flower around August time. So like everything else, there were, there were, there were seasons involved in the manufacture of flax and the linen as well. So there were the first three stages. And just one other thing to note about the beginnings. Um, flax is a very greedy plant. So you can't plant it two or three years in a row. It would destroy the soil. So you had to have crop rotation. And again, records from County Cavan and different parts of Ulster show us that it was normally a three-year cycle. So one year they would plant oats. The next year maybe flax. And the next year would be potatoes. And then they'd go back to flax again. So it was a rotated um, system. So once they, the seeds then were sown, obviously you have to wait then for a number of months for the flower to grow, for the plants to grow, I should say. And at that stage, then we move on to the next slide. So you had pulling of the flax and the retting or rotting of the, of the, of the plant. So once a blue flower came on the plant, that meant that it was ready for harvesting at that stage. There were different grades of um, linen. The very best linens, the fine linens, were actually made from green, green linen cloth. And the green cloth was taken when the actual blue flower was still on the, on the plant. So it hadn't gone to seed. So in some cases, the, the plant was harvested at that stage. And then if the farmers or the, the producers wanted to keep the seed they had to wait longer until it, it sort of you know until the seed came on the the plant and then it was pulled and at that stage it 
became linen. So the green linen and brown linen produced at different times. In Ireland, most of the flax seed was actually imported in the 18th century. They didn't have very good flax seed initially. So when they the the ex between Ireland mainly at that time, um, the ships would have been America with linen and on the way back came back with flax seeds so hogsheads hogsheads of flax seed or large barrels of seed which was to for the next years so it, it was a, a symbiotic relationship between america and as you know probably the trade here flourished in ireland because it did not compete with england in england the big um the big crop in the early century was wool. So the, the government at that stage suppressed the Irish woolen industry because it was competing with the English one. But they did allow the Irish to grow linen or flax, I should say, to grow flax to produce linen. So therefore the linen industry flourished here and this huge trade grew up between Ireland and America. And then when people started to emigrate or migrate between the two countries, flax, was one of the things that was common as well. So you had migration of people to America and they set up the contacts then on the other side of the Atlantic to, you know, to, to bring the, the seed back to Ireland and to bring the, the finished product over to America and sell it there. So, and in this stage, as I said, you had the pulling of the flax. So once the crop was ready around uh, August time, it had to be hand pulled. It could be pulled by machine because you would damage the stalk and the stems. So it had a loose root, so it didn't take very much effort to pull that, but it was a laboursome job. Once the flax was pulled then, it was put into stooks, and basically then it was left out to dry. So basically for a number of weeks then it would dry, and then it basically had to be put into these, um, watering holes called flax holes. They're normally called flax holes in this area. So I live in Kutil myself and my mother's family were called Carrahers or are called Carrahers. And they had actually, they purchased a farm from a previous family who were called Whitfield. And the Whitfields were a Quaker family who lived in this area. And on the farm, my great grandfather purchased the farm, there were flax holes as part of the farm. So flax had been grown on the farm for, for over, a, you know, 100, maybe 200 years at that stage. So there was a tradition in this Kutil area for over two centuries of flax growing. So the flax hole, the flax was put in in stooks into the flax hole. It had to be done by hand. And then it was weighed down and sealed. And again, the process depended on the quality of water and the different conditions of the soil in the area. So sometime between eight and 10 or 12 days, it was ready then to take out. If you left it in too long, it could destroy the crop. And if you left it in for too short a period, it could also just destroy the crop. So it was a very skilled process. And the people who did it knew, it. they knew by the smell when it was rotting, that it was time to take it out. The oils rose to the top of the water to seal in the actual crop so that the fermentation could take place. And that would break down the outer bark and the inner um, core of the self. So then when it taken out, it would be to release the first of the actual linen. So that process, as I say, took a number of weeks and then it had to be taken out and laid out to dry. Now, again, lots of us tell us that it was a terribly smelly process. It was almost, you know, if you can imagine rotting, rotting eggs, uh, probably worse than people make silage in the countryside. And city dwellers might feel it's terrible, but you can imagine it was probably a lot worse. They took the rotted flax around, but somebody had to. So basically then, once and it was prepared then the next stage. So the next stage was called scotching and hackling. So again, you can see from one of Hinks's descriptions here, drawings, that the women again were involved in hackling. So you can see this lady here has a large knife. It's called um, a scotching knife. So it was made from wood 
So they would drape a strand of the fibers along a wooden bench and beat it with this knife to remove the bark, the remains of the bark, which was still on the plant from it. And once that was done, once the scotching was done, sent a specialist you can see on the right hand side this man here with his bench a hackling bench and you can see different grades of nails and he's the struck through these different graded nails like almost like nail brushes to remove any loose toe and also to to, you know, to, to just remain to, to leave him with the with the with the best grade fibers the long shiny fibers and the hackler was a very qualified and um, very particular type of job. So they, they were paid very well at the time because if they didn't do the job well, you had poor quality you know, uh, yarn at the end of it. So the hackler um, was a very, you know, very well respected person in the community. Later on, obviously, when the machines came in and the 19th century jobs were done in mills, but you can see here during the 18th century, as I said, we're concentrating on that at the moment. It was all done at home, in the home. Now, it all looks very swiss in these drawings. Obviously, it wasn't like that in loans. It was very work and people worked in this fine, you know, style of clothing. Most people were very poor and they had harsh conditions. So we move on to the next stage then, and it's the spinning of the flax. So you can see here on the left, a lady with her spinning wheel. And that was very common in Ireland and in particular Ulster and County Cavan being part of Ulster, every house would have had at least one spin at that time. And again, it was a lady at the wheel. It was mostly women's work at the time. So the word we use in the English, which spinster actually comes from this, the fact that women spun. Again, you know, spinster is not a word that most women like anymore. It's not really used very much in the 21st century, but in the last century, if you called somebody a spinster, she wouldn't be very happy because obviously she was a lady who didn't who had never married. The word, I suppose, the term comes from the fact that women were so busy at the spinning wheels, half of them didn't have time to get married and they were making enough money to be independent. So they didn't need men in their Right. So the word spinster was actually a positive word earlier on. So once the once the flax uh, uh, fiber then was spun into yarn, it was put on a reel. So you can see here on the right hand side, the the yarn was put onto a reel, and then it was it was um, sorted into different uh, lengths, and they became hanks. They were called hanks of yarn. And the hanks then were boiled in large pots sort of or dirt, whatever, you know, discoloring to the next process, the next stage in process. So we move on to our next slide and weaving. So the hanks of yarn were brought to the local market. So Cushel being my local for that, all the towns in Cavan would have had markets for yarn more particular for linen. So I'm going to be talking about that in section in the, in the presentation, but in most of the linen centers like Kutil, for example, and Arva, Balina, you had lots of weavers who lived in the area too. So the weavers were the specialist men who actually, they, they, um, the, the thread and wove into cloth on these large so again you can man in this picture obviously it was a man's work at the time the labor was divided between men and women in the family and then later on it even became more uh, divided we used ring um weavers and they went from place to place looking for work so again once he had you know created they thought he had to bring that then back to the market and it was still in a sort of a dull condition it was called bright state almost like a dark sort of a, a, a dark sort of a yellowish color and 
heat market and it was sold then to drapers, linen drapers. And the drapers get to specialist um, centres called bleach greens or bleach yards. And the bleachers then had the process of turning this brown or green linen into white linen, the, the linen we're used to seeing, you know, in the in the stores. So the weaver was a very important um, job, obviously, and a very important um, task. And as I said, you only found weavers in the very in the close to the brown linen market towns. Now, the final stage in the process was known as bleaching. So I mentioned the bleaching. This image shows a bleaching yard, bleaching works. It's normally near a river. It has to have a water source. That's a very important thing to remember about uh, the linen trade in Cavan. We will look soon at a map showing you the main towns in Cavan, which had a river close by where the ones where linen was most successful, where the bleach greens were located, the bleach yards. And once the once the once the linens were actually um, boiled in in different types of solutions, um, acids and alkalis, they had to be taken out. And you can see here long strips of um, the linen cloth. So these could be 30, 40 yards long. Were laid out on the green. It was called the the, the bleach green, which is on the grass basically to dry in the sun and the sun helped the bleaching process. It was taken back in and bleached again and back out on green three or four or five times. So that would have taken weeks to do or months depending on the weather in the 18th century. So it was a hugely laborious task and job and a lot of money had to be tied up in that. So only the richest people could invest in bleach greens and bleach yards. So once it was bleached then it was taken back to the market and it was sold to these um, drapers again and the drapers sent it to the white linen market which was in Dublin the main one but as the industry grew two other white linen markets emerged in Newry and Belfast as well so the linen from Coutil would have gone to all three places and then it was exported mainly to Britain and America you know during the 18th and 19th centuries so that's really the process of creating linen from the flax seed at the beginning to the thread, to the yarn, and then to the finished cloth and the bleaching. So after it was bleached then, it was actually beetled. There was another process. So it was beaten again with hard, um, or with, with, with uh, wooden mallets in the 18th century to create a shine on it and to make it finer for use. And once the beetling was uh, finished then, it was taken, as I say, to market and it was graded and stamped and sold. So it was all a very controlled uh, process. There was a linen board founded in the early part of the 18th century in 1711, and it went on right up until the 1820s. And it, um, it was a highly regulated um, industry in Ireland. So seal masters were sent around to all the great linen market towns like Coot Hill, and they inspected you know, the grades of linen, the different types of cloth, to make sure that, that it was of this quality. If any imperfections were found or discrepancies were found, um, the weavers were fined or the drapers were fined. Right, so I'm going to move on to section two now. And basically here, we're looking at the growth of the industry in County Cavan. So, as I mentioned earlier, there were a number of towns not, uh, that were sort of specific to linen in Cavan. The whole county wasn't, uh, you know, involved uh, at the same rate. So if we look at the map of Cavan, um, I just down uploaded this recently. You can see all the main areas here. You can see lots of lakes, which is obvious. You know, it's typical Cavan scenery, the Dronlin Belt with all the little lakes. So up in the up in this section here, you have um, the Coot Hill, the Coot Hill area with all the lakes around it. And you're right on the border with County Monan here. So you can see you're close to Rockari, to Drum, to Annamullen, and to Bally Bay. So all these areas in, in, county, in neighboring County Monaghan were hugely important in the linen industry as well in the 18th and 19th centuries. So the, the market, the brown linen market at Coutil was, you know, one of its major success, successes was that it was close to all these other places as well. So lots of the 
spinners and lots of the weavers would have come to the Kutil market to sell their yarn and to sell their cloth when it was produced. And Kutil then ended up having a lot within the area, a lot of bleach greens and whatever. The other major centres then for the linen production in the county, so we'll I bring the arrow down here, you can see Cavan Town here. On the other side of Cavan then, to the southwest, you have Balanya. Balanya is a linen market as well, brown linen market. You have Belve, which is the home of the family, who were the main lords around here. And just up towards Kilishandri, you had another family, the Nesbits of Crostoni. They would have also used the market at Balanya to sell the linen. The other major centre, as I say, then was Kilishandra. And again, it's connected with the plantation of Ulster period. So you had Scottish settler, the Hamilton family. So it was a very large um, linen market at the time. The other one that is Arva, which again is on the border. It's a border town between three provinces. It's the only town in Ireland, I think, that's on the, you know, on the edge of three different provinces, Ulster, Connacht and Leinster. So Arva is controlled by the Atten family who were connected again with Market Hill in County Armagh. It had major, a major linen market. So you can see the importance here of waterways to the whole process. Now, again, this is just a map dating from or showing where the main markets and fairs were in the county in 1852. This map was produced by William Crawford, uh, University of Ulster. And you can see here some of the road networks at the time as well in the middle of the 19th century. So we assume, I suppose, living in the 21st century that everybody was interconnected back then, but they weren't. So roads had to be built, you know, they were manually built. And if a landlord at that this 18th century market town, they, they could apply for funding to have roads built between their town and the next market town. So they didn't have to pay for the labor. If they didn't have a market or a patent for fairs markets in their town, they had to pay if they wished to build a road to the next village or town. So obviously transport was very important in in Ireland at the time for, you know, for food and also for the linen trade. So if you had lots of roads leading to your town, all the better because you had more people coming and going to buy and sell your products. So Kutil up in the northeast of the um, county was very serviced by roads. So you had roads linking it with Cat, roads linking it with King's Court, the road to Bally James Duff. And obviously then roads into County Monaghan as well. So we can see all the main markets that I mentioned a few minutes ago here in the 1850s, Kutil, Kilishan, Arva, Bala, and then obviously Cavan, some of the other towns to the west of the county were in existence, but they weren't actually large brown linen market towns. Obviously, flax was sold there, yarn was sold at all these markets and brought to the bigger towns then for the weavers so that they could turn it into cloth. So we move on then to, I suppose, one of the most influential people in the whole story of Lynn. He wasn't a cabin man, obviously, you can see from his name, Louis Cromellon. He was actually a Huguenot. He was um, a refugee from France. He came from Picardy in France. He was a Protestant and the Protestants were being persecuted by Louis XIV. Catholics. So a lot of them held and they fight to England by him, the third, William of Orange. And this particular gentleman, Louis Cromwell, was invited to Ireland. So to try and improve the linen industry in Ireland. So he came to Ireland in 1698 and he opened a bleach works and a, a linen centre just outside Lisburn. And he was paid by the government to improve the whole processes in Ireland to bring them up to scratch with, with some of the countries like Holland and Belgium and France. So within a short period of time, he was hired by the linen board, as I say, and the, the whole processes you know, were revolutionized within a generation, I suppose. Now, we're moving on to some of the 
influential families who were involved with the linen trade in County Cavan. And Christopher, I'm sure, will recognise the house where he was, where he lived as a child. So this was Bellamont Forest in Coutil. It was built by Charles Coote, one of the Coote family. Now, Charles Coote was the father of the Earl of Bellamont, and he was the son of Thomas Coote, who was known as Judge Coote. And Thomas Coote um, was the really important, influential part of the family. He was the man who was involved with the linen trade. He was on the linen board in Dublin. He was one of the founding members. And he was terribly influential in bringing the linen trade to County Cavan. So I have a, an article that I discovered in Armagh uh, Library years ago when I was doing my research. And it was written by a man called the Reverend Dean Richardson. And it's dated the 5th of April, 1740. So I'm just going to read you the first page um, from this because it's really important. It fills in the whole history of the linen trade really in Cavan in the Coutil area, basically, where, where, the, where the whole thing started. So it says Coutil, a handsome town, which from a small village consisting of three or four cabins before the late revolution, is grown up now to be by much the most populous town and the place of greatest trade in the county. Here is a church in decent order, a good market house, a large market kept on Fridays, in which there is plenty of provisions and an abundance of good yarn and green cloth sold. So we're getting a description here. Remember, this is 1740. So the church that he describes isn't the see today in Coutillo, it's the old church street, which has now disappeared. The market house, again, was not the that we that we know of as, you know, was in the street. It was an older one. It was an original market house, which again disappeared a long time before the other one um, uh, was used. So basically he mentions here good yarn and then green cloth. So the yarn was brought in by the spinners um, to be sold. And then the weavers bought that and came back then with the, with the cloth. So it was green cloth at that time. So they obviously pulled the flax when the bar was still on, on it. They didn't save it, they didn't, they didn't plant to turn to seed. So they were importing their seeds from America at that stage. Now, there is a great number of weaver and bleacher town and neighbourhood, and no less than 10 bleach yards. So again, that's a really important thing to remember. He mentions all these bleachers and weavers in the area, and 10 bleach yards. So I mentioned a few minutes ago that these bleach yards you needed lots of money. You need, you know, you needed to be a big, uh, wealthy person, an investor, to be able to put your money into a bleach yard. You had to wait maybe for maybe two or three years to get your money back. So it was a huge gamble. And some of the guys who created these bleach greens went bust and they disappeared, you know, off the, you know, off the calendar. I have a list of some of the names around Coutil of the bleach greens, some of the families who were associated with them. So we have, um, for example, in Coutil, there were Brunkers. So the Brunker family were involved in bleaching in Coutil. They lived at Bell Green, which is on the Coutil Sharkock Road in the townland of Bach. You had Powell's of Annis Fort in the same district. You had uh, who lived at New Grove, which later became Murphy's Mill. So it's just a Drumgoon Bridge. And the Willis family at Anna Lee, so Lee House. So had uh, another branch of the main family at, at Dremor, out beside the Monaghan border. And you had, I came across one of the Moravian um, settlers in the town, a man called Matthew Reed, who also had a bleach green at the Moravian settlement, which is on the old bridge road out of Coot Hill. So they're just some of the, the bleach the bleachers in the town, but this guy, man, Dean Richardson, I should say, mentions these bleach yards in 1740, so there could have been more by the end of the century. Now, just continuing his little description of the town, um, so the least of which bleaches a thousand pieces of cloth every year, so it was a huge, you know, it was a huge concern at the time, back in the you know, middle of the 18th century all of which was brought about by means of a colony of Protestant linen manufacturers who settled here on the encouragement given them by the Honourable Mr Justice Coote, 
who with a great deal of good management took care to have the new town so tenderly cherished in its infancy um, that many of its inhabitants soon grew to be rich and brought it to the perfection which it is now at to which uh, we may add the great pains that he took and the expense that he was that he was at in propagating this profitable branch of our trade through other parts of the kingdom that he may justly be called the father of the linen manufacture in Ireland. So that, that's a big tribute to Thomas Coote, Judge Thomas Coote, who's buried actually in Church Street in the old graveyard. And we've just received 20,000 euro funding to have the site where the Coote crypt is restored because it's in a bad state. So the Coote family, as I say, were terribly influential. He was responsible for introducing a, a, a colony of linen, Protestant linen manufacturers into the Coutil area. So we know that um, from the sources that there were seven different denominations in the town by the 19th century. So it was a haven for workers, you know, linen workers, skilled linen workers. So we had Presbyterians moving to the area. We had Quakers moving into Coutil. We even had Moravians coming here. So a very small church, but they came and they had a settlement in Coutil. And the people involved in the Moravian settlement were big, were, you know, big, big into the linen trade as well. So we had weavers in that settlement as well and spinners. Now, if I move on to the next slide, you can see the beautiful market house, which was in Coutil. It was built in 1906 at the height of the linen the Brown Markets in Coutil. So you can see there are two levels to the market house there. It's all, it was also used as a town hall in the upper portion, but the upper portion that they, in those early years was used for sealing and stamping the linen once it was sold, once it was purchased, I should say, on the street. So what would happen is on the market day, the people would come in and throng into the streets. So mainly around Market Street is where the flax was sold at the top of Market Street and Church Street at the cross there. And then once it was sold, it was brought down to the market house to be stamped, sealed, and then it was taken away by the drapers. Now, if we move on to the next slide, we come to Arva, a map of Arva, an estate map of Arva in 1847. And Arva, as I mentioned, was owned by the Atchison family. And I have here a man called Archibald Atchison, Atchison, who was knighted to the Earl, or he was ennobled to become Earl of Gosford. They came from a place called Gosford in Scotland originally. They had a large estate at Market Hill in County Armagh under the Ulster Plantation, but they also put an estate from a man called Bran, who had been originally granted the land around Arva, and he didn't want to stay there. When he saw the state of the place, he hoofed it back to Scotland. And apparently en route, he met with one of these Atchison's and said that he would sell them the estate for a horse, get him back home. So the Atchison estate at Arva created a really important linen centre. As you can see here from this map, this was a design dating from 1847. You can see down here in the left, bottom left hand corner, there was a fair green and there was a linen market in that part of the town at that stage and I have a description here from the early part of um, the estate about the you know the, the estate was going into decline I suppose at this stage in the 18 in the early 1800s but it does mention the flax and the linen trade so it, in the report um, written it's called um, the Greg survey and it dates from around 1820 this particular um, report was written but it, it goes back in time to the early 1800s. So it says here, it has been supposed that the value of lands at present ought to bear a near proportion to their value in 1802. But it is a well-known fact that in 1802, the flax yarn was fully double its present price. The inferior crop and, subs and, sorry, and consequent scarcity in due raised the price of produce and temporary occurrence of peace just year most probably afforded prospects which as is well known as far 
from being disappointed were more extensively realized than if peace had been more permanent, so that lands are not now so valuable as in 1802. So this describes, I suppose, the ups and downs of the trade and war and peace, as we know at the moment with the war in Ukraine, it is affecting all the world. At the time you had, um, the, there were the Napoleonic Wars and the price of flax went away up at that stage. There was a huge demand for linen. And once the, um, the Napoleonic Wars ended, then there was a slump again. There were also um, variations in weather in Ireland. There were, you know, very severe winters when you might have very poor uh, crop of flax and therefore you would, wouldn't have um, much, much to sell. So it waxed and waned. Again, there are two terms used in, in you know, in, in the linen trade. The, the fortunes of these landlords went up and down depending on how much they could make from the crop each year, from the sales. And all these landlords would have had markets and, you know, rights to the markets and fairs. And people paid tolls to sell the yarn and also the linen. So every piece that was sold, that was money in the pocket of the local landlord. So if we move to the next centre, which was Kilachandra. So again, here you can see a view of some of the estate, some of the grounds of Kilachandra Castle. Now, Kilachandra Castle was burned in a fire in the early 1900s. So there's no pictures of it extant. But this is the um, part of, the, of, the, of the, the building, the grounds of the building. And again, as I said, Kilachandra was the home of the Hamilton family. And again, we have from the early... Um, plantation records. Sir Francis Hamilton came over from Scotland along with some of the Craig family and they set up large estates around Kilachandra. And obviously because they were Scottish as well, Presbyterian, there was a link straight away with flax and with linen. So they brought these skilled workers with them and they set up a very important flax, brown linen flax market at Kilachandra, which went on right into the, you know, into the 19th century. And once the Hamilton family died out, it was the estate was taken over by the Southwell family, who were originally from Limerick, and they continued the um, the tradition of flax, flax growing and linen production in the Kilachandra area. Finally, then we have this view of Balanya House, which is still standing. Now it it, it looks different I suppose from when it was originally built you have a, a little butcher shop in the front there and there's provisions out in front of the, the building itself but we know from a date stone which is above just where the, where the arrow is above the main door it was actually built in 1821 by the local landlord as well uh, who was um, Fleming his name was James Stuart Fleming and they were the main landlords again around Balignà. They lived at a beautiful house called Bellevue or Belleville, sorry, Belleville House, just, just outside Balignà. And you still have the name Fleming associated with Balignà. There is a folly there called Fleming's Folly. It would have been on the grounds of Belleville House. Close by, you also have, on the road towards Kilishandra, you had Crostoni and you had um, another influential family there who were also involved in the linen trade. So you had the Nesbits of Lismore Castle and they would all have sold their, you know, their, their wares in the markets of Kilishanda or Balignà. Now, the reason I focused on those four towns, Kutil, Kilishandra, Balignà and Arva is because we have records from the linen board which show that they were the most important linen towns in the area. Sorry, that's just a view of Lismore Castle in Cross Tony before it, it was demolished. So again, beautiful house. A lot of these houses were built on the back of linen as well. You know, the landlords had huge wealth and a lot of it was based on linen, the linen trade. Just to <clears throat> give you some statistics, the population of Ca County Cavan was massive in the, you know, in the, in the 18th into the 19th century, it obviously kept expanding from the 18th into the 19th century. So on the, you know, just before the Great Famine in 1841, the population of County Cavan was a staggering 243,000 people. 240 people. The current 
census, well, the last census was 2016. The, the population at that time was 76,000. So a huge difference, almost, you know, almost 200,000 less than what it was in 1841. So where did all these people go? What, you know, where did they come from and how were they supported? It was all because of flax and the linen trade, because you only needed a small portion of land to grow flax. Most of the farmers at that stage in the 18th century had about five acres rented from the local landlord. Their five acre plot, they only needed roughly half an acre to sow their flax seed. So you're talking about, you know, a rood or two roods of land or half an acre or to one acre. And they could survive for the year on that with, you know, a little bit of agriculture as well, a little bit of farm work. So if we move on then to the next slide, we can see here the estimated value in annual sales at the brown linen markets of County Cavan. So we have four different years here across the top. In 1783, 1803, 1816 and 1820. So you can see the four towns that really have any import at all are Arva, Balanya, Coothill and Kilishandra. And of all those four towns, Kutil is by far the most important. Huge sales. So in, in 1783, for example, £52,000 worth of, of linen was sold at the, at the Brown Linen Market in Kutil in that year. That had more than doubled, you know, 20 years later. So in 1803, it had gone up to £114,400. And by 1816, then there was a huge slump in the trade. It had gone down again, back to 52000 A slight rise in 1820 to 55700 but at that stage, then the whole process was changing. So I mentioned earlier in the story from a cottage industry, it became a manufactured manufacturing um, process, which was based on factories, large factories in the Lagan Valley in the northeast of Ulster. So places like <clears throat> County Cavan started to lose their value or their place um, as linen markets. And the linen was concentrated in the Lagan Valley, in the huge factories there, the huge uh, mills from the Lagan Valley. So Cavan still produced the flax, the raw material. It was still sold at the flax markets, but the linen markets disappeared at that stage. So that's just um, a short little sample of the, you know, the value of flax and linen to County Cavan at that stage. So I'm going to move on swiftly to Section three, flax production. I can see here that it's, the time is rolling pretty fast. <laughs> flax production, obviously you can't have linen without flax. And flax, as I said, was produced in Ireland. It was produced in all the counties. Um, so we see here of Ireland, the different flax growing areas. And you can see the predominant part was Ulster. And in Ulster, we see County Care approximately 500 acres of land were grown, were sown uh, as flax in 1796. So at that stage, I suppose, really it was small enough compared to some of the other counties. So if you go to the neighbouring county of Monaghan, a, a thousand acres would have been sown in Monaghan, a thousand acres in Loud. If you go to places like Brown and Donegal, you have up to 4,000 acres being sold in flax. So there was an incentive. The linen board at that stage brought in an incentive to try and get more people to, to sow or to, you know, to grow their own flax and to save the seed. So basically they brought in this scheme whereby if you sowed um, so much ground, like a quarter of an acre or one root, you would be given a premium or a prize of a spinning wheel. So lots of people invested at that stage in flax because they wanted to you know to get these premiums if you had up to i think it was five acres of flax you were given a loom so you you know weaver could start or you could sell the loom to somebody who would who would weave in the area so if we go to the next slide that's just a simple photograph it's actually my own i bought this flax wheel or spinning wheel i should say about 
15, 20 years ago, I was walking past the local auctioneer's house, Andy Smith's in Bridge Street, and they were literally selling off the, the furniture and this spinning wheel in the window, and it just said, buy me. So I actually went to the auction and I ended up buying it. It's a lovely old, uh, typical spinning wheel from the century. It's engraved with the, with the name A. Todd. A. Todd. And I discovered, I went through the flax list find out who these people were. There were odds. There were some in Tyrone and some of them in Donegal. So it could be from that area originally, but these would have been common throughout County Cavan and throughout you know, the whole area in the 18th century, the spinning wheels. So acreage of um, under flax then, if we look at the year 1814, we see that there was a huge increase. So Cavan, as I said, had only 500 acres in 1796. By 1814, there were 3,000 acres being sowed um, uh, in flax. Neighbouring county of Monaghan had over 5,000 acres. The total of Ulster had 72,000 acres. So a huge amount of land was being sown, you know, with flax seed. If you compare that to the province of Munster, the total for the whole province was only under 7,000 acres. So Cavan itself was almost half of what the whole province of Munster was producing in 1814 at the, at the height of its, you know, um, growth in, in, in this part of the world. Now, we look again at the organization of the whole thing in the 19th century. So you have all these mills start to appear on the landscape and they're still there. A lot of them, you know, the ruins of these mills are around the place. So we have scotch mills. I mentioned the whole scotching process earlier where it was done by hand with a scotch knife, a scotch blade. The scotch mills made it a lot easier, a lot faster. So you had all these, there were macadam um, engines that actually ran the scotch and the, the wheels, which came around, there were wooden blades and the scotcher would place the, um, the fibers inside the blades to, to beat them down. And it was a very dangerous job. So the scotch mill, a lot of these poor people that worked there lost fingers and hands they were pulled in to the scutcher and also there was a lot of dust and you know they would have inhaled a lot of these um a lot of the fibers so it was a very unhealthy job but it was part of the you know the landscape at the time in the 19th and 20th century in Cavan, Kusha, there were scotch mills uh, again as i mentioned murphy's was one of them and people all the local farmers grew their flax and when it was retted and prepared, they brought it to the scotch mill then to have it scotched. And then it was brought to market and sold. So basically, you have all these different uh, mills in Ulster again. The number of mills in Ulster from in 1865, for example, there were 1,314 scotch mills in Ulster, which was 92% of the total for Ireland. If you go back, if you go down to uh, 1910, the number had dropped dramatically to 597, but that was still 99% of the Scotch mills in Ireland. So we can see that the province of Ulster was still, you know, very important, most important for the whole linen trade, because as I mentioned, all these mills, these large mills opened in the Lagan Valley and you had the large investors who were able to pour their money into these mills. So places like Cavan couldn't compete you know, the, the poor linen weavers lost, their, lost their, um, their jobs. A lot of them had to emigrate or reinvent themselves at that stage, you know, by the middle of the 19th century. So you can see from some of the religious censuses, people's occupations were down as weaver, weaver, spinner, spinner. By the early part of the 20th century, those, those occupations had disappeared in this area. So I'm just going to finish here with some sources that I use. So I know some of you might be looking into this later on at this particular um, presentation for some of the schools. William Hinks engravings from 18, sorry, from 1783. Sir Charles Coote, as I mentioned earlier, is a very important source. He wrote two surveys. He wrote actually three, one for Cavan, Monaghan and Armagh. But the Monaghan one in 1801 has a whole chapter dedicated to the post of linen production. And he has really important descriptions of places like Coot Hill and the market of Coot Hill at the time. I mentioned the linen board and its flax list. So the flax lists 
for 96 are really important for genealogy as well. Looking for your family name, that's one of the earliest places you'll find it, maybe on the flax list for each county. So there were the parish list of people who won, you know, these fields for the amount of flax they sold. Arthur Young was a, an economist who wrote uh, a tour in Ireland, 1776 to 79, and he visited the Farnham estate in Cavan, and he visited Lord Bective's estate um, near Virginia, the Hedford estate. And he described the, you know, the production of linen as well and yarn. It was really important. It was the most important thing, flax growing to this part of the economy, you know, the Irish economy. The Ordnance Survey memoirs, again, date from the 1830s normally, roughly around that time. And I have a volume here which features a picture of Coutil on the front of it, volume 40. So you can see the old Catholic chapel and the Church of Ireland at the end of Market Street. And inside there's a description of the town as well. Very good description of the town. And it mentions the importance of linen as well in the town for the, you know, for the whole area. But there's also a section on bleach, bleach fields and mills. And he mentions at that stage, uh, the, the author of this report was a man called um, Lieutenant P. Taylor, dated 1835. He mentions that in the town of Lisbon, the ruins of extensive premises of a bleach field are still standing. Its situation on the banks of the River Annalee and contiguity to an extensive bog render its localities exceedingly favourable for the purpose. He, he also mentions that lower down the river in the townland of Bock are two bleach fields with extensive premises. The upper one still carries on business, but to a limited extent, and the lower one is now converted to a corn mill. So again, he mentions further down another mill at Lisnagir, which is Murphy's Mill, and that I mentioned at Drumgoon Bridge. So all these mills were actually important industrial buildings on the landscape in Cavan. And when the flax industry started to wane, corn production was important. So they were converted, you know, from one purpose to another, they became corn mills. Uh, the final uh, source there I have is Samuel Lewis, which is a really interesting one. It's like a, a compendium for the whole of Ireland. So it mentions all the towns and villages and parishes in Ireland from A to Z. And he will give you a description again for the one for Coutil, he mentions it as a really important center for linen sheeting. Um, one of the major centres in Ireland at the time in the early part of the 19th century. So on that note, I'm going to end my presentation. You can see here the little sculpture we had um, erected outside Coutel at Halton's, just on the river there, at the river. And he's called the Flax Harvester. And that idea came from Coutel Heritage Association. So um, a sculptor was commissioned to produce this sculpture to remember the whole importance of the linen trade and the flax production in Coot Hill. So on that note, I'll say thank you very much. And if anybody would like to ask a question, I'm happy to answer a few. If you'd like to unmute and ask a question, or alternatively, if you want to pop a question into the chat at the bottom of the screen. Actually, I think, Patrick, there's a, there was a question in chat, was there? Let me see. Um, uh, I see there's a question there, Patrick, in, in the chat. Um, that function. Uh, um, hold on, sorry, I'll just open that up. So how many yards approximately in a piece of cloth? Um, I think 25 yards, Marja. Um, the, you know, the sheeting were normally one yard wide and 25 yards long. The, you know, the, the majority. But Coutil was in a really important centre for sheetings of linen. But they were much wider here than in some other centre. And Coutil was also important as a, bleach, as a bleaching area. As I mentioned, you know, in the 1740s, there were 10 bleach yards. But Dean Richardson mentions the Coutil method. Of, so there was a whole way of bleaching invented in Coutil at the time. Um, he wrote a letter to a man, a local man called Williamson, to describe the process. Of bleaching at the time so it was you know it was it was a, a new a new way to do it. it it's down the period from weeks to days i think 
But then by the 19th century, the whole process had gone down to one day then when the bleach mills opened in the north, you know, the northeast. Wow. <clears throat> um, and another question is, do you know how much flax was produced in Leinster in 1814? I don't. I don't actually have figures for that. But it wouldn't have been very, very important because the, the linen board produced or produced all these figures. And, you know, from my research, the majority of it obviously was concentrated in Ulster. But there were little colonies in other parts of the country as well, like in parts of Munster. But they were mainly, again, similar to Coot Hill. The local landlord would have um, attracted a little colony of Protestant, you know, manufacturers to come to the area with their skills and that's how it sort of you know took mm -hmm. off in, in these centers thank you patrick for just an excellent talk it was absolutely fascinating um oh you're very welcome yeah Collette, I, is it? It was great I, I i'm the one who asked the question about leinster as well because we're actually just trying to uh, we're trying to grow flax here at the moment just as a community oh, project good. but oh, um good. Uh, we discovered uh, as part of our research, Kathy Scuffle is working with us and uh, we discovered little nuggets of information like, for instance, Knock Lion, which is outside Tala, was originally yes. in Irish as Knock Lynn, you know, and it's made us curious okay. to find out a bit more about yes. where flax might have been grown around Dublin and so on, you know. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, I know there's a lady called Sandra Coote. Um, who lives yes. outside Virginia and Sandra actually has she, you know she she produces flax and linen all in one from her home she's in the, she I think she's one of the linen weavers she's on that website so if you just yes. check her name out she might be able to help you Sandra I, Coote I just met her on Thursday <laughs> oh you did oh good yeah, very great, good a great woman my gosh yeah. what energy yes we're going yes. to go for spinning lessons with Sandra I hope in the autumn very good, very good. So you can, sp another another one of the sayings, it's the spin a yarn, you know, you tell stories. So these women, when they were laboriously working on their spinning wheels, they tell each other stories. So that's where the, the expression comes from, spinning a yarn. <laughs> Thank you again. Okay. Is there anybody else who'd like to ask anything? Patrick, when was the... Uh, last flax market what what sort of decade or year was it last all oh, right i actually i didn't really bring that up i suppose uh jonathan i know that the the flax markets were resurrected you see during the war periods as well the first world war the great war and also the second world war because they, you know they needed the linen for the war effort so they, they you know linen was used for the making even um, i think it was the 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 parts of the aircraft and also in, in parachutes and in uniforms and everything else and lint then was used for you know for for um, dressing wounds so it was really important so flax you know flax was resurrected at that stage the government you know put on a big effort for people to to produce flax again and the flax market sort of had a resurgence at that period but I suppose by the late 40s, 50s, it sort of died off again. So it would have been probably sometime in the late 40s or early 50s, to answer your question, when it sort of finished in the coastal area and, you know, the cabin area. Thank you, but there are still people in the area who, who know about it and, you know, have, have lived through it and, and produced flax on their farms and they know the process. So, you know, it's important, I suppose, to, to talk to these people and have it recorded because in the future it'll be gone. Just Patrick, there was there. I mean, like in terms of the types of flax, was it was there different uh, um, <clears throat> types of flax? Like, uh, was there any particular flax favoured by Cavan people, or I don't know. If well, in the I suppose in the I think in the 18th century, Jonathan, they mainly imported it from America. Mm -hmm. But then in the by mm -hmm. the 19th century, it was coming in from the Baltic. So Thanks. it was Baltic flax. It was a better quality, I think. Mm -hmm. As after the American War, dependence and everything else, the links were, were lessened with America with the trade. So mm -hmm. they had to bring in Dutch and Baltic flax. Mm -hmm. 
very interesting. Um, is, is there anybody else who would like to, to ask a question before we just finish up? Well, I think that may be, be it now. Um, just uh, before we go, I'd just like to say thank you, Patrick, for a, a very informative talk this evening. Um, uh, we've all learned so much more about uh, what's an important part of our county's heritage. And um, I'm sure that tonight's talk, as it's being recorded, uh, it will be a valuable resource for both primary and secondary school projects and uh, other people interested in this topic. Um, here in Johnston Central Library uh, in Cavan Town, we're privileged also to have a copy of Patrick's uh, thesis, uh, Coot Hill, an 18th century Ulster linen town, uh, which is part of the library's local studies collection. And I'd just like to say we'd, we'd look forward to, we look forward to inviting Patrick uh, back again in the future um, and uh, just to say good night, God bless, and ihoa. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Jonathan, and thanks everybody for tuning in. It's nice to see some familiar faces. <laughs>